Vegan and carnivore diets, are they radical and unscientific? Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Westman and welcome to my channel where I review and debunk nutritional information online. Thank you for sending these videos. This one, Vegan versus Carnivore Debate, Science-Based Insights, is going to be kind of a, a good interview and discussion about carnivore and vegan diets. And, and I guess at the end of the video, I, I'll give you my thoughts on whether these are just extreme things that no one should ever do, or are they legitimate things that people should try? This is gonna be interesting to see. Confused about cholesterol? Doctor badgering you about medication? Get the facts you need to understand why cholesterol is not the most important thing when it comes to cardiovascular disease and what to look at instead to assess and reduce your risk. Join me for Beyond Cholesterol, the two biggest risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Sign up for my free webinar below. The biggest divide that exists in the nutrition space, on the internet especially, is veganism and carnivore. Why do you think there is this massive divide in nutrition, especially online? I think we first need to acknowledge that the online space and the, the views that we see, the whole sleuth of extreme views we see, are, are not representative of the typical views held by academics. It's helpful to to build an audience and to drive engagement if you have a contrarian or different <laughs> position to the consensus, particularly for, for people that are, you know, lack, lack trust. And so we, we see these extreme views online, but we often, I think, see that and presume that the science is not settled, that the science is confused. Look at all these people with completely contradictory viewpoints. But we, we need to recognize that firstly, a lot of these viewpoints that we're seeing on social media that we're exposed to are not coming from domain specific experts. Well, that, that's a good point. And um, always consider the source. This is, um, is someone who looks at uh, internet information and, and is now considering the nutrition space have to agree that the mainstream nutritional information uh, is, uh, uh, well, rather limited. And, well, and so another view or another way to interpret why the internet space is so different is that the consensus view, you know, the traditional academic approach and, and really hasn't solved everything. It hasn't, I mean, if we, <laughs> if we really had, uh, had understood nutrition, uh, we wouldn't, ever have a, uh, someone who we couldn't fix. If a dietitian knew exactly what to do, they would be able to match the nutrition for the person. And, and likewise with doctors, if we could fix our medical issues with food and we knew how to do it, we certainly would. But so I, I'm gonna throw just a little curveball here saying that a lot of people are online looking for nutritional information because the academic and traditional consensus view approach hasn't worked, hasn't helped them. And then to complicate things more, most doctors have no understanding of the diet or nutrition and how they can apply it for chronic, nutri and chronic medical issues instead of medications. So while it's true it may not reflect the consensus or academic view, it doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong. You know, we all eat food th two, three, four times a day. And I think that leads to many pe people feeling like they, because of that, they can have a very strong opinion on nutrition and food. And this is different to other fields of science. You know, if you or I wanted to learn about the stars or the galaxies or the planets, you know, we're going to want to listen to an astronomer or an astrophysicist, someone that's an actual expert in that, that field. And so online, we have a lot of noise and, and I think distraction, confusion, because there are a lot of voices speaking about food that are not domain specific experts. And I don't think that necessarily all of these people have bad intention. 
you know, there's a thing called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And it's where, you know, you, you're overestimating your capabilities based on the level of knowledge that you actually have. Well, you know, I can see this is meant to be a video to be oh, dismissive of information you're going to see online. And, you know, if you're one of my patients, you realize that you've been following advice that is not mainstream. It's not what a traditional dietitian in the low-fat army, uh, the low-fat diet will fix everything. You're, you're, it's just a different approach, a different way to do it. And, it. and while I don't teach quite a carnivore diet, it's almost carnivore, carnivore-ish, and it violates lots of the academic consensus-driven guidelines. So, you, know, you have to have carbs, you have to have fruit, all this sort of thing, but it reverses medical problems. And so if you've had benefit from that, uh, well, and then you've actually found an academic place. I'm at Duke University. I follow the research and the science that uh, many other people don't know about. There's a textbook that came out just last year on the keto diet that most other people don't know about. I contributed chapters in that textbook. So the idea that uh, something is outside the mainstream or you're not a domain expert actually I, I, that doesn't bother me too much, you know, as long as you're following someone who's teaching a, a method that's helped many people. Um, although if you have short-term results, it doesn't mean that it's going to be safe and effective in the long run. On the other hand, if there's no long run data yet, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be bad and that you should be afraid of doing something. You should monitor things along the way. So uh, I can see now that this uh, uh, actually is, I don't know, trying to be dismissive of these obvious improvements that people have uh, that uh, for me, 25 years ago, when I first was trying to study the low carb or Atkins diet, as it was called, there were internet report. Yeah, there really was internet, but it was not much, not much, uh, not, no social media then, but you could see pre and post pictures that people were posting. And it was kind of hard to ignore that, that it could work. And yet it doesn't prove the safety of it. If you have, you know, even a hundred people, I could find the before and after photos doesn't mean that in a hundred thousand people, it will be safe. So we we'll, we learn about these approaches over time. And, uh, so far, uh, well, let's go. Would, do you really want to learn about the solar system from an astrophysicist? I mean, now we're getting into the problem of people can be overtrained, and you actually do want to have teachers appropriate for the level of uh, uh, someone in elementary school being taught by an elementary school teacher rather than an astrophysicist. You want to get the information in the right. Um, right language, the right ability for someone, match someone's ability to learn. And, and so that, that kind of erodes the idea that you'd always want to learn from one of those astrophysicists <laughs> about the solar system. You want to, you want to make a model and see that the earth is actually going around the sun because it kind of looks like the sun's going around the earth. If you look out the window. So, uh, Anyway, it's interesting to, to see his uh, take on this. So I, what I see online is deep convictions, absolutes, you know, sensationalized posts, not having context. And that's the opposite of scientific thinking. Scientific thinking is understanding there's uncertainty, is being open-minded, having humility so that you can actually objectively review all data, whether it is in line with your current position or it challenges it. And the idea of a scientific thinker or approach is that with that open mind, you allow your views and positions to evolve over time. If, if we're not approaching science like that, then what can happen is we have a, a current pre-held view and we just go out and look for evidence to reaffirm that and double down on it. Well, I see here he's talking about um, if it works for you, Therefore, you're going to try to get everyone else to follow what you're doing. You know, I find that's much more common in the vegan space than the carnivore space. Uh, vegan teaching, I think, can be healthy to follow a vegan diet. Uh, there's been no head-to-head -head 
comparison between vegan and carnivore or low carb or keto so they can't really scientifically say it's better than any of these other things they can say it's better than a standard american diet because typically that's what they study the vegan diet against uh, so but uh, the carnivore group to me they're not trying to get you to eat meat because god told someone that you should eat shouldn't eat plants a lot of the vegan the religious element that got to the veganism and vegetarianism to start has this idea that all humans shouldn't eat meat because it's a dictum or edict from God. And so, and I don't see that as an element in the carnivore or low, definitely not the low carb or keto approach. If you look at the scientific textbook on ketogenic diets that came out last year, there's no section that says, you know, this came down from tablets from, you know, Moses brought them down or something, you know, it's not religious, it's a scientific thing. So I totally agree that science should be open to lots of different approaches, lots of different viewpoints that work rather than uh, signing off on this is the only way to do it, unless there's really proof for that. Totally agree. How much of the absolutes that we see online do you think are coming from a place of bio-individuality? For example, Paul Saladino feels amazing when he eats a certain way, but someone else wouldn't feel that way. I feel like people have this sense of ownership over the way they eat and they think it's the best way to eat because they feel good doing it. Do you feel like there's a different diet for everyone or everyone should kind of be eating the same way? Does that make sense? There's a few parts to answering that. One is I think we often assume that short-term changes in health reflect long-term disease risk and you know, that's not always the case. For example, smoking can help aid weight loss, but smoking increases cancer long term. So I think that's that's one explanation for that. I don't think that we're all genetically so different such that one person does best long term on a carnivore diet and another person does best on a vegan diet over 50, 60, 70 years. But I I do think that, you know, there is no single dietary brand or label that is best. There's a theme. And, you know, this is a little bit more great. It's less absolute, which is why this is not really that popular. <laughs> you know, that theme that you see in the literature that's associated with the best long-term health, so lower risk of various types of cancer, lower risk of metabolic conditions like type 2 diabetes or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, lower risk of cardiovascular disease, dementia, etc. is a diet that's high in fiber, it's low in saturated fat, it has a bias for plant protein, but it can include animal protein. So relative to a, to a standard Western diet, it has more plant protein. And it limits ultra processed foods that have added sugars, salt, oil, and other kind of artificial or even natural additives that you wouldn't find in your kitchen and you wouldn't use in, in everyday cooking. Did you hear the uh, remnant of the old paradigm there, worrying about saturated fat in the food and having more plant-based things? I, I, if anything, I, I haven't looked into his background very much, but he comes from the more traditional, you know, uh, that saturated fat is bad. The new way of looking at things is not to focus so much on the food, but to look at the metabolic effects of the food so that if you eat something that causes inflammation or causes metabolic syndrome, which is elevated triglyceride, low HDL, high abdominal circumference, high blood glucose, high blood pressure, these are the things, the metabolic consequences of the food that you wanna stop eating those foods rather than any particular one because actually you can eat lots of saturated fat on a low carb or carnivore diet and you're burning that fat the fat doesn't have the same effects that it would have if you were eating carbs at the same time so uh, it's interesting to see even though he's calling for science he's saying that maybe everyone could use a different diet and there's not one particular diet. I don't know. I, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to find the perfect diet that fits everyone's needs and can actually feed a planet uh, that it, it, there are pockets of where people don't have enough food and lots of places where people have too much food. So I, actually, I, I'm 
optimistic that there may be a scientific answer that we can understand more rather than signing off on, well, no, of course, we can't know a perfect solution. Maybe, maybe there is one. That, to me, is a more scientific sort of response. Now, that theme I just described, that could be a Mediterranean-style diet, it could be a pescatarian diet, it could be a plant-based diet, it could be low-carb, it could be high-carb. Hmm. So I think there's flexibility within that for the individual to you know, adjust and play around and try things and then look at blood work and go back to the drawing board. And we, you know, maybe that's something that we'll discuss, but that's my advice to people is very much to within that theme, find a way of eating that leaves you feeling good today is something that you can adhere to because you enjoy it. Because none of this matters if you're only doing it for two or three weeks. <laughs> what are you going to do for decades? We're talking about lifetime exposure here. That's really what shifts the needle in terms of risk of these diseases. And what leaves your blood work and important predictors of longevity, risk factors, what leaves them in good shape. And you know, so there is a, a degree of personalization that I 100% agree with within that theme, but I just don't think it's you know, as extreme as one person does best on all meat and the other person does best on whole plants. Well, <laughs> that's an interesting ending. Uh, maybe someone would <laughs> do better on just one or the other way of, of uh, doing things. Well, you know, uh, in the context, if you're watching this and you have weight loss uh, goals or you wanna reverse diabetes or other metabolic issues, you have to remember that there's a, a phase where you can do any number of things to get to your goal, reverse the diabetes, reverse the obesity. We call this the, the weight loss phase if it's obesity that we're treating or diabetes reversal phase. And you could take uh, medicines, you could take pills and shots and surgery, or you could do a carnivore diet or a vegan diet or a particular diet where you give up certain things. It's not forever. And so I want to just kind of change his ultimate uh, answer uh, that uh, you, you have to do something that you can sustain for a long period of time. No, if you're trying to reverse something, uh, you can do it for a short period of time, then change what you're doing for the long run. So if someone comes to me worrying, but will I ever be able to eat fruit again? Sure. You can, you know, if you're using it for this method, you can go back to eating at least some of those foods, but I'll be honest with people. And if that's what is what's causing the weight regain or the diabetes coming back, then yeah, you'll want to consider giving that up for the long run. But most people can go back to eating carbs on a low carb diet. If you're doing a vegan diet, I, I think they do kind of say that forever you shouldn't eat animal products because to me it's more of a religious sort of teaching where it, you know, it's an all or nothing sort of thing. I know there are some carnivore diet proponents who do kind of say it's an all or nothing thing forever and all. I'm a little more pragmatic about it and use these uh, extreme diets as a tool to get you to a goal and then you can decide what to do. I hope you like this. If you do like, press like, subscribe, ring the notification bell. I'm putting out new information on Wednesdays and Fridays. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And check out adapterlifeacademy.com.